G'day and welcome to another Rural Flying Doc presentation. My name is Dr. Jerry Considine and today we're going to talk about herpes zoster. So herpes zoster is also known as shingles, um, which shingles being the Latin for belt, uh, but we actually get the herpes zoster from Greek with uh, herperin meaning to creep and zoster meaning belt or girdle. And it's a uh, reactivation of latent varicella zoster virus or chicken pox as we know it. And it can happen in people that have had a viral illness, uh, those that are under immunosuppression therapy, but other sinister causes such as leukemia, lymphoma, and radiotherapy involving the spinal cord. And it's characterized by a painful vesicular rash along a dermatomal distribution. And this is because the reactivation occurs in uh, the dorsal root ganglion. Just looking at a bit of epidemiology, and one third of people will experience herpes zoster in their life and recurrence is actually more common than previously thought, up to 4 to 7%. And around the world, the rate of herpes zoster is actually increasing, mostly due to an ageing population and increased use of an, uh, immunosuppressants, but also with now widespread vaccination against chickenpox in, in children. So the clinical features that will be found, there's a prodrome with pain, itching and tingling, and these prodromal symptoms can precede any visible rash by days or weeks. It's unusual for that to be the only sign, but if it is, it's called zoster sine herpete. Um, and the pain in certain areas before the rash can certainly mimic ischemic heart disease, cholecystitis, or even renal colic. Once the rash is found, it's unilateral, uh, thoracic in the thoracic region, cervical region, or even ophthalmic areas. And your differential diagnosis then will include herpes simplex virus, contact dermatitis, insect bites, scabies, impetigo, candidiasis and folliculitis. The clinical features seen, there'll be a maculopapular rash which can sometimes spread across a few dermatomes, but then usually in a single dermatome, clusters of vesicles and these will crust over after seven to ten days and at this point they're not infectious uh, and will be healed in two to four weeks but some residual scarring and pigmentation can be common. Here's a picture of the typical look of shingles, quite a bad case probably. Uh, you can see the macular papular rash there and then the vesicles occupying a single dermatome. Some complications of zoster, uh, you can see post-herpetic neuralgia and you're looking at a very common side of uh, complication with over 30% of people with herpes zoster over the age of 80 will get post-herpetic neuralgia and that increases with age. It's a moderate, it's characterized by a moderate pain that lasts for over three to six months and it's described as a burning or lancing pain uh, even allodynia and these people are unable to wear clothes, at least what that's what their excuse is. Our other complications, we're looking at ocular or eye involvement and herpes zoster ophthalmicus is, uh, happens in 10 to 25% of cases and it's where the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve is involved and, and there should be a H in that ophthalmicus. And uh, this can obviously lead to keratitis and other itises such as conjunctivitis, retinitis, uveitis and glaucoma. And if you find that there's vesicles on the nose, then that means uh, there's involvement of the nasociliary branch of the trigeminal nerve. And this is highly predictive of eye involvement with herpes zoster. And this sign is called Hutchinson's sign. Ramsey-Hunt syndrome is probably more well known but it's less common than the other complications and it's when the geniculate ganglion of the facial nerve is involved and you can see vesicles in the auditory external auditory canal uh, and on the palate on one side but and the patient will experience loss of taste on the anterior two-thirds of the tongue and some facial weakness. The last two complications are uh, disseminated zoster. So most with herpes zoster will have a few lesions outside the dermatome to blame, but if there's more than 20 vesicles outside of that dermatome, then you might be dealing with disseminated zoster. It's more common in the immunocompromised and can even involve visceral organs. Bacterial infection can also occur. Usually the causative 
bugs are Staph aureus and Staph pyogenes. So covering with something that has uh, gram positive like uh, flucloxacillin is the go here. Investigations aren't usually needed given it's a largely clinical diagnosis, but if you do do a viral swab then from the base of a vesicle that's burst is a good option. And depending on your lab, there could be a one or two day turnaround time with PCR, but you might be missing the boat for your 72 hour window treatment wise and we'll get to that soon. So um, it's important to, to know clinically if that's what you're dealing with. Serology is also available, but doesn't add much to your diagnosis and can be misleading is um, in the fact that uh, there are false negatives due to low IgG antibodies in the early phase of the disease. Looking at management now, antivirals uh, are the first line. So valcyclovir and famcyclovir are preferred given that they've got greater bioavailability and less frequent daily dosing. You'd like to start within 72 hours of the rash onset uh, for best effect, and but if the patient has uh, any eye involvement, then you can start at any time, and that also holds true for those who are immunocompromised compromised, and those with disseminated disease. So as far as pain goes, your analgesia options include paracetamol and prednisolone for a week with a taper. Your second line including amitriptyline and oxycodone. If the patient's suffering with post-hepatic neuralgia, then your neuropathic meds like gabapentin and um, pregabalin, mental blank, sorry, um, topical capsaicin and a, a TENS machine can be used. Also, quite radically, an excision of the um, scar to blame can be an option. But you want to try and avoid post-hepatic neuralgia to begin with. So if you get uh, onto treating the virus and the pain initially, then you might avoid the post-hepatic neuralgia. Prevention is uh, possible. There is a vaccine available, and it's been shown overseas to decrease the incidence by half. It's kind of uh, not much evidence in the way of the decrease directly of post-hepatic neuralgia. Uh, and there's a few contraindications, including those who are pregnant or any immune um, impairment. And we're talking about patients with HIV and low CD4 counts or on high doses of steroids. Um, it can be offered to those above the age of 60 years um, as recommended by the National Prescribing Service um, and can be given with the influenza vaccine, but unfortunately not within a month of the 23-valent pneumococcal vaccine. Reducing transmission is obviously a good way to go as well. Uh, and the Non-crusted le crust lesions can be covered with a light non-adherent dressing and washed with saline to remove, remove exudate. And avoiding susceptible contacts uh, like young children who haven't had chickenpox, pregnant ladies and the immunocompromised. A few practice points to finish off with. Herpes zoster is becoming more common as our population ages. We must think of complications, especially involving the eyes, ears and nose, and to look for the signs of these. It's important not to wait for viral swabs or bloods. It's a clinical diagnosis, and if you suspect it, then jump onto the antivirals before that 72-hour uh, limit is reached. And of course, you're going to treat any of the nasty complications or disseminated types of zoster with antivirals at any rate. Get some early analgesia in there to try and uh, decrease the rate of post-hepatic neuralgia. And for those in the appropriate age groups who aren't contraindicated, you can consider the vaccination. Unfortunately, in Australia, as of 2013, it's not subsidised. Here are the references that I used for today's talk. Murtar's Venerable General Practice book. Australian Prescriber's got a fantastic... Uh, section on herpes zoster which formed the basis of this talk and you can access it at the website there and the Oxford Hand Handbook of General Medicine. Well thanks for your time today and I hope you enjoyed the talk and if you have any ideas for future talks please hit me up on Twitter at Rural Flying Doc or visit the website. Cheers again. <laughs>